I'm here with Jennifer Roberts and Elizabeth Herder. Both of you have been part of the International House of Prayer for many, many years. Jennifer, from the very, very beginning. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that's come out of, out of this is uh, the, the power differential between um, Mike and the girls. You, you were friends with, with, with many of these women yeah. that are bringing forth these allegations. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the context, because people go, these, these girls, it was a consensual relationship. Mm -hmm. talk, talk to that. Well, I think when we first arrived, we came in August 98, so before the House of Prayer started. Elizabeth did. You were around that time because we were, we were students yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And the, the atmosphere, the buzz in the whole community was almost like Mike Bickle was a god. Mm. And because I didn't have really context of him before arriving, I was it, it threw me off a little bit, like how people almost got weak in the knees when he would walk in the room. And it was just odd. Um, but observing the impact that he had on people first was shocking to me, but then I also gave into it as well. It started to impact me as well, where I started to care a lot about what he thought. I started to uh, want to be, you know, uh, I wanted to be one of the faithful ones. I wanted to be one of the true ones. And seeing his impact, and I was a 29-year-old woman, like the frontal part of my brain was developed, but he always had a cluster of young women that adored him. And I think when you're in that kind of dynamic, you, you really don't have the ability to separate yourself. And so there's that, it, it's like a therapist, it's, it's like a doctor, there's, there's a there's a power that they have that you become vulnerable and, and they matter so deeply to you and have the ability to distort and twist and manipulate in a way that a, a normal friend wouldn't. And then you throw in the age difference, you throw in the stature, you throw in, he knows the Bible so much, he prays six hours a day, six days a week, and you just start to almost go, wow, he knows better. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think my observation during that time, it, it, it's interesting. I, it, to be honest, it was probably more of jealousy because I actually was markedly not in that inner circle of girls, but I noticed it yeah. and I knew it was happening and I would hear about, uh, you know, and I knew some of my friends were in it. So I knew about like that Mike would come over for, for pizza nights just with the girls and watch movies. Mm -hmm. And I was a little bit younger than Jen. And I was kind of in that in-between place where because this incredible man of God is doing it, mm -hmm. I figured there must be this just really neat, unusual way yes. that you're allowed to relate. Right. And I just was maybe on the outside yes. of that. Um, and, but I, at the same time was always very beloved to Mike, mm -hmm. at least in my own mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believed that, um, Mike loved me very much. I believed that he was a huge fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had nicknames for me, appropriate, you know, appropriate. And, um, one of them was the rainmaker. I loved the affirmation that I got working sure. with Mike and within the leadership mm -hmm. team. And so um, I, you know, just part of my own story is that I felt incredible loyalty. Yeah. I, I'm not someone, I don't have a story of, of Mike uh, victimizing me or hurting me in that way. And so when I entered into the way that I've been advocating, it was in mourning and tears and shock when I realized that my friend my, my leader and my friend mm -hmm. was not going to do the right thing. It was, it was almost childlike. Uh, I'm not a very childlike person, but it almost was childlike mm -hmm. because I thought this terrible thing is happening. Mike must not know how bad I'm going to go tell him. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to do the godly thing and it will all get better. Mm -hmm. And when my husband and I started to go on that journey, we very quickly found out that he was not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was extremely disillusioning because mm -hmm. I went in fully trusting. Right. I think there was a level of 
believing that he almost didn't have the ability to be sexually inappropriate mm -mm. because so mm -mm. many of his inappropriate behaviors were done in broad daylight. Mm -hmm. Like I saw him play footsies with girls under the table mm -hmm. and I thought, that is really, really stupid, but Mike, he doesn't get it. He didn't get that that's inappropriate. So I gave him a pass on so many things mm -hmm. because I thought, that's just Mike, he does stupid things. Mm -hmm. Now I realize that what was done in the daytime was to really hide what was really done in the dark. Mm -hmm. And so that is terrifying now to think of all the things that I observed and mm -hmm. I didn't say anything because I gave him not just the benefit of the doubt, but I didn't actually think he was capable mm -hmm. of doing something like that and taking advantage of the trust that he was given to his congregants, to his students, to his research team, to these cluster of young women that, that really were faithful and loyal and adored him. And he, he betrayed that trust for his own pleasure. Mm -hmm. So this is a clergyman with a duty of care over his, yes. his flock. And you know, you've talked to a number of these, these Jane Does that have, have brought stories. I mean, do you think a consensual affair is, is an appropriate term to, to class that, that, that relationship? 100% uh, no. Now, I'm not an expert, you know, so it, you're talking to Jennifer, not some expert with a PhD, but absolutely not. Because, I mean, even my own story, I was groomed in high school by a football coach. It didn't, it didn't go physical, but I remember the, the power that he had over me in the grooming mm -hmm. process and the, the little steps that I was starting to uh, take to receive his affirmation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I blew the whistle when I saw that it was happening to much younger girls. I went, okay, I'm 18. I'm not going to say this is anything, okay, I'm smarter than that. You know, you think you're so smart at 18. But when I saw him maneuvering with a 14 year old, then I went to the principal and several of us young girls were sitting around the principal's office telling our story. And we had all been manipulated by this football coach whose end game was to have a sexual relationship with us. And there was no way that was consensual. There was no way that I had the ability to say no in that moment because of the trust that happens with a, a teacher and a student, the way a trust happens with a pastor and a congregant. And so in this particular situation we're talking about, there wasn't just a power differential, there was also such a significant age gap, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that if there's not an age gap, that that power differential isn't there. Mm -hmm. And so, no, not consensual. So you've been through this yourself in terms of um, moving from this kind of intimate abuse relationship into actually blowing a whistle. How, how yeah. hard is that? It's so hard, I think, for women, period, to come forward with any kind of sexual allegation. The reason it's 92% of the stories are true is because it's so hard to do it. it. Because immediately the light gets shined on you. Well, what were you wearing? What did you say? What did you look like? You wanted it. So you already have to cross all those hurdles to come forward. And you now, in this case, you gotta cross all those hurdles Plus you're dealing with someone with followers that are into the millions mm -hmm. and who are you? Mm -hmm. And the risk mm -hmm. for Jane Doe and Jane Doe's to come forward is enormous. They have everything to lose and they're welcoming a microscope of scrutiny upon their lives for something that they're a, a victim to. So the, what does she have to gain? What do they have to gain? They gain nothing and they lose everything. And I don't think people have actually done the math on that. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. Yeah. Uh, uh, one dynamic that I noticed that goes along with this is that when there were questions about women interacting with Mike, me included, kind of blamed the woman. 
mm. right? So there was, there's different women that have this unusual access to Mike. We'll just say that. Mm -hmm. And I personally observed numerous ones of these. Mm -hmm. And I would always excuse in my mind, absolutely, Mike would never be involved in anything inappropriate. Right. So gosh, she must be a little bit Right. Obsessed. Right. She must be a little bit off. Yep. Um, and you like this, this. You go to mental instability so quickly. Yeah. So because I truly, with my whole heart, believed he was incapable of, of anything like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Elizabeth, tell me how you got into this situation. So yeah, the way that my husband and I uh, got involved in, in this is that a mutual friend, a leader, we, we understood that his life was blowing up. Um, and we started to ask some real direct questions and his answers to those questions were so alarming um, that we had the pastoral response that I think most believers would have, which is, brother, who's helping you? Mm -hmm. Who's helping you? Your wife is having an affair? Who knows who's helping you? Let's get involved. Let's get some intervention. Right. And the story starts to unravel that this is a deep, dark, gnarly yeah. web of stuff that no one wants to know about. And, um, and the, what I would now classify as spiritual abuse that he was under to be silent mm -hmm. about the destruction of his life mm -hmm. was unconscionable. And our, as we walked through this process with him and hit brick wall after brick wall with most of our friends, again, these are, remember that what, Jono, when we're talking about um, the ELT, we're actually, we're talking about our friends. Yeah. I, I, we have yes. labored together for decades. Some of my dearest friends, yes. these are not those guys, no. it's us. Yes. And so as we start to try and bring this forward, we're just stunned mm -hmm. that our beloved ones have kind of like this, this wall. One in particular said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear anything. Mm -hmm. And in the same conversation, this leader had told me that they were one of the top three leaders of the entire organization. I said, how, how can it be that, that this kind of weight should be on, on us and you would not even want to know about it? Um, and so, but, but our heart posture was just of loyalty and love and, and much like our, our brothers talking about the way that they came into this, we absolutely thought we would all be on the same team. Mm -hmm. To, to deal with this sin and destruction. Mm -hmm. um, and as our friend's story unfolded, it became clear that, oh my goodness, Mike had some manner of relationship with his wife far before his son had an affair with her. And um, coming to that realization and trying to get anyone to care, right? just to care, so, Jono, I think one of the main, uh, you know, heart cries that my husband and I have had is a second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we watched this unfold in front of our eyes, um, our cry to all of our brothers and sisters was, how would you want to be treated if this was happening to your life? Jono, what would, what would you want me to do? What would you want me to do if I found out that someone had seduced your wife? away from you. If I found out that you were in an apartment over across town by yourself and that just not too long ago you'd been full, your life was full of friends and children and love and leadership at the house of prayer and now you're alone mm -hmm. and stripped bare in every possible way, what would you want me to do? And so that's how my husband and I proceeded uh, with that as our kind of clarion call, the second commandment. And it wasn't difficult. That's how clearly right and wrong this situation was. There was a lot of attempts to make it very hazy and kind of like, oh, who could know? Why, you know, it wasn't hazy. It was very clear. And so even though it gutted our lives and we lost basically our entire community for standing up for this, it wasn't difficult. It was so clear what needed to be done. So Jennifer, one of the questions is we're sitting here in 2023 and this happened for this, this main Jane Doe, 20 plus years ago, what, why did she not come forward before now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No, that, that's a great question. Um, and it's a complicated one to answer because of the way I think we divide ourselves in our own soul and compartmentalize trauma. Mm. And, but you can't do it for your whole life. There comes a point where you, know, you keep trying to put something away and put it away and then the shelf eventually breaks. Mm -hmm. And I think that was Jane Doe's moment. The shelf broke and the trauma got unearthed. And I have a grid for that. Uh, just my own story of having multiple instances of, of sexual abuse. And I was very transparent with my husband through all of it and something emerged for me as late as, as in May, a 46 year old secret that I hadn't even shared with my own husband. And when that came forward and he was able to help me define it, 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 it caused me to go, oh, I get it why people come, come out late in life because I had learned to compartmentalize. You have to, that's what trauma mm -hmm. does. You have to compartmentalize so that you can be a functioning adult. Mm -hmm. But in the mercy of God, there's a moment where light breaks in and freedom comes mm -hmm. and the truth comes up and it's worth the shattering of the shelf to get to the full uh, light of God uh, being, you know, exhibited in the person's life and the story to come out. So it's, it's, I don't think it's late. It's the perfect timing. Mm -hmm. I, that's how I see it. This is the perfect timing in her frame, in her healing process, in her journey with God. God decided now's the time mm -hmm. and I concur now's the time mm -hmm. and I believe her and it's so courageous for her to come forward. And I know for some people that maybe haven't had trauma in their life, maybe it's complicated to understand that dynamic, but it, it's a real dynamic that, that memories just get pushed back and pushed back and then eventually they can't be pushed back anymore and they have mm -hmm. to come forward. You know, we were, we were asked, she was asked, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, what's your end goal? Mm -hmm. She had the most amazing answer and I've uh, had the privilege of sitting with this particular Jane Doe, she's not the only one, but this particular one, uh, multiple times as she's shared her story, mm -hmm. and the um, there's utter consistency, yeah. and uh, sometimes more more is shared depending on the audience, and but in the trust level, but um, yeah, but one what she said was safety for other women. Exactly. That is her goal. Yes. When she realized that it was not just her, right that she was not just Mike's one dirty little secret, mm -hmm. that there were others, mm -hmm. that is what compelled her. And I think that's so noble. Yes. She's sacrificed her whole life and reputation now yes. in order to protect many other women. Yes. And um, she, she has not changed her story. Right. She has not. It's, it's a remarkably consistent story. Mm -hmm. And we know that one of the Jane Doe's said if I had known about these other stories, maybe my story wouldn't be what it is today. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm.